Lazarus Bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Communion to people who are 
are sick and who can't come to church. Right now, there's um, a very old lady, a great grandma, who's 90 and three quarters. Uh, and that's what she tells me. She says, I'm 90 and three quarters, you know, I'm almost 91. Who is um, in a rehabilitation unit at a hospital now while she's. Um, yeah, that's got the communion wait for him. Do you remember I showed you? Uh, yeah, we won't touch it. We're just going to look in their eyes, okay, George? Yeah. Why do we have those eyes? Um, for to, so that's a good question. So we have all this that I take to give her communion at the hospital because Jesus taught that when two or three are gathered in my name, I will be with them. And he said, whenever you get together, share bread and wine to do this to remember me. That's a nice shirt. I know, you have a nice shirt.
he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life.
Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus came, himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning with while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them breaking of bread. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. scriptures don't say. They were walking and talking about the tragic end to Jesus' life, followed by these astonishing claims of Mary that Jesus had risen. But somehow, as the risen Jesus drew alongside them, they failed to recognize him. How is it possible that after three years of following him around, being part of all his teaching and the miracles and everything, that they didn't recognize him? 
I think perhaps it's because what we perceive about an event or situation is so highly biased by our expectations. Our brains are always filtering out in some information and biasing our perceptions of other information. So perhaps the reason why these two failed to recognize Jesus was simply because they just couldn't imagine that he could be alive, that he could be risen from the dead. It was so outside their expectations and indeed the expectations of everyone. And it's only when Jesus sat at table with them later that evening, when he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to him, they remembered how he had done exactly the same thing at that last supper before his arrest. And it's in that moment their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and then immediately he was gone. And as they looked back and remembered, remembered that conversation, how suddenly all the scriptures started to make sense as he explained to them everything from Moses on. And they recognized that as he, they were having that conversation, there was this sense of energy and aliveness in them. And the way they put it was, our hearts were burning within us as we listened and understood and heard the story of the scriptures. So if they'd been thinking about it at the time, they might have recognized the presence of Jesus as, as they were having these conversations about the scriptures. And that is the pattern that's given us too. We who come so long after that first Easter, we come to experience, to know, to recognize the risen Jesus with us as we read and tell the stories of the scriptures and as we gather around the communion table to receive the sacrament of the Eucharist. And Cleopas and the friend immediately return to Jerusalem to tell the others of their experience. And they too share the encounter with the risen Christ that they know. And this is what happens when Christians gather together. We share our experiences of Jesus' presence and love, God's grace at work in our lives and in the world around us. And what happened after that first Easter was the lives of these friends were completely reoriented around their sense, their experience of the presence of the risen Jesus. Last week, we, we heard the story of how doubting Thomas was transformed into believing Thomas. And I shared that joke with you in which uh, Thomas was frustrated, he got stuck with the name Doubting Thomas. And uh, in the joke, they referred to Peter as runaway Peter. And today, our experience of Peter is passionate preacher Peter. And that first lesson from Acts is part of Peter's first public speech, his first time of sharing his experience of Jesus with any who would listen. And Peter tells what becoming a friend of Jesus looks like. It looks like a change of direction in one's life, a complete reorientation of priorities. And as a sign of this change of direction, a person is washed in the waters of baptism, and they receive forgiveness for all that has gone wrong, all the mistakes they've made of the past. And all this is accompanied by the gift of the Holy Spirit, who joins that person to the community, the church, the friends of Jesus. In a later letter, which formed our second reading, Peter describes this experience of re reorientation around Jesus as being born anew. 
If a Peter were writing to us now, I think he might describe it not so much as being born anew, but perhaps he might say, it's like pressing the reset button. We have to do that with our devices when everything just gets so mucked up that it doesn't work anymore. We press the reset button, restart anew. And this being born again, this baptism, this reorientation, is like the reset button in life. It's a change from the, what Peter calls futile ways to a reorientation, a focus on the risen Jesus. And when Peter talks about reorient, the futile ways, he's talking about the values and attitudes of the dominant culture in which those first friends found themselves. And it's not a lot different from the dominant culture in which we find ourselves. And in our culture are the same values, the pursuit of material worth, success in what we call the corporate world, power perhaps over others. And Peter says, when you turn from Jesus, you let go of all those priorities. And in God's economy, silver and gold are of no value. What is of surpassing value is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which is the new life, the means through which God gives us God's life in all its fullness. And having been joined with others in this family of Jesus, God's Holy Spirit is at work in us, enabling us to love one another deeply from, a, from the heart, with a genuine mutual love. And so then we live out that great commandment to love one another as I have loved you, which Jesus gave his disciples before his arrest. Those first friends of Jesus, those who were the first church, learned quickly that experiences of the risen Jesus happened when they gathered together. And then they remembered Jesus promising, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And so it still is today. The Holy Spirit most often reveals Jesus to us when we gather together to read and discuss the scriptures and when we celebrate the Eucharist. And according to Brother Jeffrey from Society of St. John the Evangelist, the way we grow into our full stature as children of God is not through competitive individualism, what Peter called the futile ways, but by being made part of a new family, a fellowship, or what the New Testament calls a koinonia of love. It is in this community, the church, the body of Christ, that we become who we are most truly meant to be and gain our true identity. As Peter explained to the gathered crowd, forgiveness, a fresh start, and God's transforming love are free gifts for all people. Peter says the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. And those who welcomed Peter's message that day were baptized, and about 3,000 persons were added. And so many more have been added to the church down through the ages and throughout the world. Thanks be to God for the risen Jesus, whose presence and love are ours today as we share in the communion of the altar table and as we share and read Christ's word together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.